Red Eyes Radio it is. My name is Henrik Palmgren. I hope you're doing well wherever you are in the world and hungry for some information and knowledge. We have Jeffrey Smith with us for one hour today. He is the author of the best-selling book on genetically modified organisms or GMOs called Seeds of Deception. His latest is called Genetic Roulette. And uh, Jeffrey have been exposing the shocking facts about how genetically modified organisms have entered our lives with the aid of government organizations and corporations like Monsanto. He links GMOs to toxins, allergies, infertility, infant mortality, immune dysfunction, stunted growth, cancer and death. Stay with us as we talk about some of the main problems with GMOs, the detrimental health effects on humans and animals, and also environmental effects with contamination. We also talk about the latest on frankenfish, GMO salmon, a controversy that now is unfolding in the US. We also cover some of the things that you can do and the choices that you can make in order to avoid GMO foods. Please take a look at the websites seedsofdeception.com and responsibletechnology.org for more. Welcome to Red Eyes Radio, Jeffrey Smith. It's a uh, pleasure to uh, talk to you today. Thank you for coming on. My pleasure. So why don't we just uh, talk a little bit about, um, you know, a brief outline, if you will, in terms of the work that you've been doing since uh, Seeds of Deception came out back in 2003 and what you've been trying to warn uh, people about when it comes to GMOs or genetically modified organisms, Jeffrey. Well, in 2003, the book revealed that the whole approval process uh, by the FDA in the United States, the Food and Drug Administration in particular, as well as the promotion of GMOs around the world, was based on a series of lies. And I, I don't use that word lightly, but it was completely obvious in, in the book and in the documentation that we presented that um, the political appointees at the Food and Drug Administration had lied about the information that they had, had ignored the warnings of their own scientists. In fact, documents made public from a lawsuit uh, forced 44,000 secret internal documents from the Food and Drug Administration's files into the public domain and revealed that the overwhelming consensus among the FDA's own scientists were that genetically modified foods were unsafe and could lead to allergies, toxins, new diseases, and nutritional problems. I also documented how independent scientists, when they discovered adverse findings, they were attacked, fired, stripped of responsibilities, forced out, threatened, etc. And even when reporters tried to report the dangers of GMOs, they too were threatened and in some cases fired from their jobs. So we had really a smoking gun kind of evidence of, of the... Um, inappropriate promotion and approvals of GMOs and one of the things that I've been doing since then is gathering the evidence in more detail about the health dangers. I highlight the health dangers in Seeds of Deception uh, but what I've done since is I've come out with a book Genetic Roulette mm -hmm. which is uh, the documented health risks of genetically engineered foods which describes all of the peer-reviewed published studies, the industry studies, the uh, investigative reports, and the scientific understanding that now shows without a doubt that genetically modified foods are unsafe and never should have been approved. So that's one of the main thing, one of the two or three things that I've been doing since uh, Seeds of Deception was released. Absolutely, and you've been doing that uh, very well, may I add, as well. And, and in the latest video presentation that you have available on your website seedsofdeception.com you carry a very positive message in terms of uh, you know ending gmos for good the use of gmos and 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 having them you know in terms of our food supply and all that as well uh, and you you stress the idea of making 2009 an, an important year in this process as well H how has this panned out jeffrey did it go as you expected or have there been any any setbacks in this plan well i actually that was done in the in that le that lecture was in the end of 2008, and uh, what we've seen since then has been more signs of a coming tipping point. Let me explain what I mean by tipping point and why I'm so enthusiastic. And yes, we have seen some major changes. Uh, we believe that as little as 5% of shoppers in North America avoiding genetically modified foods would create a tipping point to force them out of the market. Now, we've seen a tipping point already happen in Europe. Uh, in April of 1999, in the last week, virtually every major food company committed to stop using GM ingredients there. 
And that followed a high-profile food safety scandal where a top scientist in the world, Dr. Arpad Pustai, was ungagged by an order of the UK Parliament. Yes. And after he was able to speak, 750 articles were written within a month, and the use of GMOs became a marketing liability in Europe. But that same event was underreported in the United States. In fact, according to a media watchdog group, Project Censored, it was one of the most underreported events of the year. Now, that's why in the United States, if you ask the average American, have you ever eaten a GMO in your life, 60% say no, and 15% say, I don't know. And that's laughable to Europeans who all know about GMOs, but it's also emblematic of the, of the um, way that the media has avoided the subject in the U.S. Now, because GMOs give no consumer benefits, there's only two major traits, either they're poison drinkers or poison producers. Right. The poison drinkers are able to be doused by a poisonous herbicide that doesn't kill the genetically engineered plants. The poison producers produce a poison, a poison toxin that kills insects. So no one's clamoring to eat genetically engineered foods. So there's no consumer benefits. And so if, you know, 5% of the shoppers, which is in the United States, 15 million Americans, 5.6 million households, if that many people stop buying brands that contain GMOs, that's millions of dollars lost. It also shows the demonstration of a trend here, and it shows it to the same companies that have already removed GMOs from Europe and Japan. Mm. So <clears throat> it makes our job quite a bit easier than, say, a vote, where you have to have a 51% uh, vote in order to win or change a policy. Here we just need a small percentage. Now, we've seen a tipping point in the United States against a bovine growth hormone, a genetically engineered drug injected into cows to increase milk supply. The milk changes. It has more levels of, of a cancer-promoting hormone called IGF-1, mm. um, insulin-like growth factor 1. It has more pus, more antibiotics, and more bovine growth hormone in the milk. So we have been uh, promoting the information, the documented evidence of the health dangers from this milk. And the American Public Health Association condemned it last year. The American Nurses Association condemned it. Healthcare Without Harm, Physicians for Social Responsibility. And it's already been banned in Europe and Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, um, <clears throat> but not in the United States. However, now we're seeing it being kicked out systematically of more and more brands and dairies. Walmart's kicked it out. Starbucks has kicked it out. Most of the major dairies in the United States have kicked, has kicked out genetically modified bovine growth hormone. Mm. Now, this was not a high-profile food safety scandal like we saw in Europe in 99. This was a low, slow-burning tipping point, but nonetheless, it's having its impact. Now, with GMOs, we're engineering a tipping point for all GMOs here by educating consumers about three things. One, the health dangers. Two, how to avoid GMOs. We give them a non-GMO shopping guide. Three, we tell them about the tipping point so they can get excited and, and take this message to go viral, to, to spread it out to others so that we actually engage enough people to drive GMOs out of the market. Mm. Now, engaging our progress in response to your question, in 2009, GMO-free was the fastest growing claim on brands that are sold by stores, so the store brands. And in 2010 so far, it's the fifth fastest growing claim of all brands in the health and wellness category. Supermarket News and Industry Trade Journal predicted that because of our non-GMO shopping guide and because of a new third-party verified system for backing up non-GMO claims called the Non-GMO Project, because of the two of our organizations, they predicted at the end of 2009 that 2010 would see an unprecedented upsurge of consumer awareness and concern about GMOs. And they actually invoked the names of trans fats and carbs and things that they described as culprits in the food industry that defined the decade in the past and wondered out loud whether GMOs would have a similar impact. Now, on top of that, on top of those very concrete objective um, outside data points of, of the fastest growing label, etc., I have seen 
personally, as the only person that's crisscrossing the United States regularly for seven years, speaking about GMOs and their health dangers, in the last 12 months, I have seen an unprecedented amount of educated consumers um, enthusiastically telling others about the dangers of GMOs and, and convincing them not to eat it. Hmm. I've seen doctors prescribing non-GMO diets to all their patients. In fact, the American Academy of Environmental Medicine said that all doctors should prescribe non-GMO diets because animal feeding studies have linked GMOs with a whole list of disorders which we can go over in a few minutes. Right. So what I've seen now are the signs of a tipping point from the medical profession, from the food industry, and from people on the ground in their own lives. And so it's a very exciting thing. I think if we had had more money as an organization back in 2007, we would have seen the tipping point happen already. Mm. But because of this recession, um, there's been a lot of pullback in terms of donations. And so we didn't have the infrastructure to get it out as fast as we'd like. But I think it's happening soon nonetheless. Uh, I mean, people listening to, to this program, uh, Jeffrey, will be aware of the detrimental you know, health effects of of GMOs, we've been, uh, you know, updating our website, some with your video lectures, other articles from around the world have been coming in through, you know, through the years uh, as this has been developing. Uh, but, but, and I want to talk about some of the detrimental health effects as well, of course. But one area that I want to highlight a little bit in terms of uh, uh, is this idea about the, the Monsanto, the, the the government ties as well with Monsanto here and the. Uh, you know how this has been implemented because, as you mentioned in in, in your video presentation, uh, th there is no direct beneficial aspect of GMOs. You know, and 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 therefore the question obviously becomes: Why has this been pushed at all? What is the agenda behind this? Is, is it money driven? I mean, Monsanto has this idea that they're going to be able to patent all the seeds around the world. So this could be an uh, argumentation point that this is because they're interested in the money that, that, would, that will yield for them. But could there be something else going on beneath the surface here, do you think? And, and what can you say about Monsanto overall now? Well, we know from Arthur Anderson, a company that was a consultant for Monsanto, uh, in a San Francisco uh, biotech conference at the end of January, um, they revealed how they had worked with Monsanto executives. They first asked them to describe their ideal future in 15 to 20 years, and the executives described a world in which 100% of all the commercial seeds were genetically engineered and patented. So Anderson worked backwards from that goal to create the strategy and tactics to achieve it. And um, one of the lies that they put out was that it would that GMOs would help feed the world, etc. In fact, I spoke to a former Monsanto employee who was lured into the company because of the grandiose statements made by Robert Shapiro, the former CEO of Monsanto, promising all of these benefits to society. So when he went to the headquarters of Monsanto in St. Louis at an employee orientation meeting, he decided to tell his fellow new employees and others how excited he was and started quoting Robert Shapiro, the CEO, about all the good things that the GMOs would do. Mm. Immediately after the lect after the talk, he was pulled aside by a vice president who said to him, wait a minute, what Robert Shapiro says is one thing, what we do is something else. He's the front man that tells the story, but we don't even know what he's talking about. We're here to make money. So that was an inside glimpse about the program to lie. Now, getting back to the government here, the, Monsanto was able to convince the first Bush administration